we're now going to uh, move to a special session that's near and dear to me. Um, we're going to be uh, introducing a, a panel group um, from, from my company, YGC. Uh, my co-founder, Henry Liu, will be moderating this panel. Um, and we're going to give them a couple minutes as we, as we kind of clear out the room and move them in through backstage. Um, but the context here is when we look at the startup ecosystem, there, there are, um, you know, true startups, garage founders rolling out, and those grow into venture-backed companies, or they get their revenue traction and they're able to grow organically, and then they eventually grow up and be, become big, big companies. And uh, one of our companies here is a, uh, has been homegrown here in Austin, indeed, and and they've definitely gone through that path, and it's been incredible to know some of the, the team members there and contributors to their success, um, and. Uh, Corporations still need to innovate. They still need to grow. Um, and so they have a big role in this in this theme that we have, future of work. And um, and with that responsibility, you know, a greater reach, um, larger headcount, um, they have a particular pulpit and, and obligation to to find ways to innovate. Uh, and so as, as mentioned at the beginning of the session, YGC operates an executive council. Uh, Henry, my co-founder, runs that council, and he'll be our, our moderator for this session. And I have three incredible panel guests coming from our council that I'm excited to introduce you to. Uh, first off is Wendy Howell, who has been an Austin Startup Week champion. Uh, Wendy, so glad to have you here. Um, you. Chief of staff at Cisco, and also uh, runs Girls in Tech here in town, um, an incredible nonprofit and cause. Uh, we also have Chris Pardo. Chris is the VP of Innovation here at Dun & Bradstreet and a member of our council. Very excited to have you, Chris, and have you join today. And we also have Lisa Besserman. She's the head of program and global, uh, global incubator at Indeed. Um, Indeed's been a, a massive powerhouse here in town. And Lisa's been incredibly uh, helpful and awesome with all of our council um, events and, and, uh, and membership. And, Finally, I'd like to introduce Henry Liu. Henry's former uh, growth at Facebook and a partner at YGC, and he'll be leading this panel. So Henry, I turn the time over to you and thank you all for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Well, excited to be here and a uh, happy Austin Startup Week. Uh, I know that uh, it's been, this is the third day, and so excited to see the rest of the week. And, and thank you, Gavin, for the introduction. Um, and Wendy, Chris, and Lisa, uh, I've spoken with you all individually about some of the work that you're doing, and just excited that, that you get to share that with the, the broad, broader community here in Austin and support, you know, this booming startup ecosystem. You know, we heard about Tesla coming to town, and we're hearing about, you know, Briar Capital and all these venture capitalists are looking at Austin as a destination, right? And and as we grow, as we think about future work and how do we continue to support this ecosystem, you know, and I can't help but to think, you know, how, how can we include more people? You know, how can we include more diverse perspectives? And uh, I remember uh, my time on Facebook, you know, Sheryl Sandberg was a huge advocate for uh, women in tech and women empowerment, and that you know left a lot of mark on me. And and, and it's it's an important issue that, that I care a lot about, as well as you know this year, especially uh, you know minorities representing uh, in different sectors. And, you know, it's just becoming more and more important. So just really excited to to have you guys here uh, and share your thoughts and and. Um, and also your personal mission to you know how to how do we shape the future better? Um, so um, uh, thanks for the introduction, Gavin. And you know, just kick it off. You know, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about you know how has the nature of work changed for you personally this year in 2020? Uh, it's been a crazy year. So um, you know, if one of you guys would like to go first, um, please do. Oh, I don't mind jumping in. Um, cool. Obviously, being from Cisco, you know, uh, we own WebEx. So, you know, working remotely has always been, you know, part of the fabric for uh, us being very open and flexible to that. Um, so that personally, not that big of a challenge. Admittedly, I have to support WebEx as a, as a shareholder. Um, but one of the things we talked about before you joined, Henry, was the fact that there are now, you know, 14,000 different collaboration platforms. So I think that's been challenging for probably everyone, no matter what your preference is. Um, but I'll say, you know, just to be very transparent, um, a big part of my job previously um, was travel, right? Um, a big part of my job was travel and, and I do miss that. 
Um, you may not know it, but it's quite clear that I'm uh, quite an extrovert. So I do miss the opportunities to go in and, you know, have some FaceTime. Um, you know, I just, I don't think there's anything that can take away the value of that. So it's finding innovative ways to, you know, sort of have FaceTime like this um, and, and keep the morale up. Um, and I would also say that um, uh, being very involved in nonprofit and very involved, as you were mentioning, Henry, with girls in tech, women in tech, that, that's my passion. And all of those things have always included large scale events, you know, fundraisers and, you know, women of Cisco events and things like that. So I, I really miss that. And, and to be honest, I'm, I'm quite curious to see what things look like in another 12 months from now. What, you know, when do we get back to, you know, a, a little bit of a sense of in person? Um, I'm hoping for it. Fingers crossed. So that's been my experience. So uh, my experience, you know, I, we we run the Indeed Incubator, so we are charged with um, innovating at, at Indeed. And while our mission has remained the same, we help people get jobs, I think now more than ever, um, the mission has come to the forefront of everyone's minds and we are closer to the impact than I think we have been historically in a very, very long time, given where we are with the job economy and, and, and how the pandemic has affected so many millions of, of lives. And so being able to um, be so close to the impact and build new products um, and you know, lead product development in a sense that really does impact millions of people's lives and, and we can really be closer to our mission has been really valuable. Um, it's also been incredibly challenging. You know, we, you know, when you're working in an innovation space, there's so much that happens by collaboration, um, by co-location. And so having to transition that from you know, being in the same office, working with a global team, um, to doing that all remotely and in, in some respects have created you know, a lot of challenges. Um, but also it's leveled the playing field because you know, we, do, we are um, headquartered in Austin. We do have offices all around the world. Um, and our, our Indeed uh, incubator offices are also located in Tokyo and Seattle. So it's essentially created a, a level playing field for all of the offices in Indeed incubator. Um, so I think that that's created um, you know, just this, this closer connection between the offices, which has been really great. And we've been you know, creating new programs and initiatives to feel closer to one another and to enable us to still innovate um, remotely, and I think that's really important. But uh, you know, for us, I think the major challenge and the major difference has been, um, you know, just how incredibly important our mission is now more than ever, and how we are um, building next generation products to help people get jobs. Yeah, so it's um, it's hard to follow those two answers. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's um, what has changed for me is um, people used to ask me where I was based. I would tell them out of my suitcase because I was always traveling. Um, um, so it's a combination. So my team does uh, innovation for one of our business units. There are two business units at D and D, um, and then like what uh, what Lisa said, a lot of the innovation happens face to face. Um, so we do kind of miss that, but at the same time, we do level we level the playing field, right? Because we are globally distributed. Uh, so we're basically forced to basically get on Zoom or Teams, and then everybody's ideas uh, happen remotely, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a combination of a few things. Um, what I would say is my team was already remote for the most part, so it's almost like a natural step. Um, and what I would say too is that at least in the beginning, one or two months, we were extremely efficient, right? We didn't have to get on the plane, um, but I think the overall guidance for the situation that we're in right now is to over communicate. So we're always stuck in meetings. <laughs> so basically balancing like the over communication with the uh, focus time, I think is one thing uh, that I've been really cognizant of, but yeah. Awesome, thanks for sharing guys. And, and I think uh, uh, what I'm hearing is that, uh, you know, all of you guys are seeing this communication change and, and, and travel change and style of doing business has changed, right? Um, and, what do you think will come back after this or are any of these things will come back or uh, you know I, I think recently i saw google you know uh talked about uh how it's going to be a hybrid workplace right you know where you know and facebook is looking to aim for 50 percent remote workers um but with you know some constraints and and maybe some salary cuts or you know different things and then different companies are thinking about how do we evolve you know what do you think is going to 
come back to what we have before and what do you think is going to here to stay uh, that we have here at 2020? I think it's going to be hard to return back to, to, um, to the original days, or, or I think what, what it is is about creating a new normal. Uh, at least with Indeed, we made an announcement um, to, our, to our staff that we will not require anyone to return to the office until at least July of 2021. Um, in addition to that, we're also creating a new workforce in terms of having flex opportunities, having fully remote work opportunities, and having return to the office opportunities. And so we're giving a lot of the power back to the employees to decide what works best for them, what they feel most comfortable with. And I think, you know, one of the things that Indeed is doing really well is recognizing um, just how important its people are and, and how, you know, our health and our safety and our well-being is, is number one. And, and they're essentially restructuring the entire global organization to, to follow through with that. So um, I think we're approaching a new normal in life, in business, um, you know, personally, professionally for everyone. Uh, so I think it's, it'll be hard to, to return to some semblance of what was and in, in, in turn um, think about what could be and what should be. Um, and so one of the big things that, that we're working on is creating this um, option, work from home full time uh, or having this new flex um, uh, work environment, which historically and previously we never even had as as an option. Um, and so I think, you know, like I said, I, I don't think it's really about what's going to return to what once was. I think it's about adopting and, and evolving to to a new normal and a new future. Yeah, and I think you hit on it, Lisa. It's very, um, I think almost all organizations maybe of the size that, that, that we're all from is, it's really all about that flexibility. And I think there's a glass half full element there that um, I think we as leaders uh, uh, overall are, are far more flexible and I think, you know, learning more resilience and really, really, really more than ever before focused on our people as mm -hmm. people, um, you know, not as folks that are, you know, uh, accomplishing projects and, and, you know, raising revenue for us. But I think one of the things that I, I ponder on all the time, and, and Henry, I think you and I talked about this a little bit, is you know, Cisco, Indeed, DNB, are we going to own the same amount of real estate that we always have? Absolutely not. But what does that look like? Do we own 10% of what we used to or 50? You know, so I think about and that in the context of Google, for example, maybe if they're going to allow everyone to work remotely as long as they want, which I had heard as well, what happens to that big Google building downtown? Um, what, what will downtowns look like? What are the garage is going to be? What are typical malls going to look like? And, you know, I think about mobility, right, Henry, which you and I talked about, think about, you know, none of us are traveling now, that's for sure. So, you know, you look at the airline industry and all the layoffs that are going to happen there, but, you know, the ripple effects of, well, if United and American are laying off and not flying 50% of their flights, what happens to Boeing and the manufacturing? You know, so I, I start to think all the way back through these you know, the supply chains and, and, you know, just the ripple effects of those things. Um, it, it, it's going to be interesting to watch. It's, it, it, but I think it will drive, as Lisa, you mentioned earlier, this all has the opportunity, a huge opportunity to drive more and more innovation, right? Because we're forced to, now we have to figure these types of things out, so. Yeah, so again, it's hard to follow you, you both. <laughs> <laughs> I would say overall access to talent, right? Um, like we're no longer restricted to, to where we live, right? Um, before we would hire, at least if you were gonna be uh, in the Austin office, people in Austin, right? And we have a presence in San Francisco as well as uh, New York. Now we could take a look at all these other geos, which is super interesting. So for me, I think the talent pool gets a lot higher. Um, and with that, we'll get a lot more innovation. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, also, what I would say is working remotely before the pandemic, um, not on my team, my team has already been a little bit remote, um, but primarily there was almost like a stigma if you're working remotely, now it's kind of embraced. So I feel like that's gonna remain. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I, lo I love that you guys touched on sort of the uh, um, the expansion of opportunities for, for people that can work remotely. I think. Uh, sometimes I think a lot about um, how our cities are structured, right? You know, how the, the prices and, and, and that really doesn't add a lot of inclusion, right? And, and you know, people get priced out and if you can, um, you know, afford better prices in Cairo or something, it's really hard to get a job in Austin and commute every day or 
Antonio, right? So, so to be able to allow people to live anywhere, even in the you know uh, vicinity, like an hour or two hours away outside of big cities, like and mm-hmm. we're seeing that ripple effect in San Francisco, and New York, uh, it just allows you to expand the uh, the possibilities and and potential of, uh, of candidates, right? Um, and uh, I personally want want to learn more about you know uh, are we uh, you know, as enterprises or as, as companies, employers, um, you know, I, I often think about, uh, am I doing a good job of uh, seeking out those candidates, you know, in areas that are not, say, based in Austin, San Francisco, New York, but, but say, Kyle, for example, say, you know, um, um, Braunfels or somewhere farther away, right? Um, and there might be really good talent there, but are we reaching those people? What do you guys mm-hmm. think? Well, I think now is our, well, I should probably let Indeed answer first, Lisa, if you want to, this is, this is part no, of your go ahead. It absolutely gives us, um, yeah, go ahead. we've exponentially opened up our, our talent pool, absolutely, without question. And I knew that we have pretty, we have specific programs and initiatives that we focus on at Cisco, even before this, where we were really trying to pull in more, you know, not just diverse talent, but then, you know, not just the diversity piece of it and having a diverse workforce, but then that inclusion piece, which I think is really, really important. And they are, they are two different things. You can have the most diverse workforce in the world, but if you um, aren't left with a company culture that makes it feel inclusive, then you have still missed the ball. Um, So I think, you know, I think this is a huge opportunity, you know, simply because of the, the level, the more level playing field now. Go ahead, Lisa, sorry. <laughs> I think we could also see, uh, see it on two sides of the spectrum. Uh, sorry if I'm cutting in, my internet is is uh, lagging a bit, uh, which is one of the perks of working from home. Great. Exactly. <laughs> this happens. Happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> so sorry if I cut, cut you short, I you stopped on my end. But um, so I think we're also looking at two sides of the spectrum for, for positivity when it comes to this uh, remote workforce or, um, you know, expanding, you know, your specific centers of gravity when you're looking for candidates. So on one end, um, it's helping the candidates find jobs that they might not have had access to previously because of transportation, because of commute time, um, and because they were just kind of cut out of, of the role based on not being in that specific location. But on the other side of the spectrum, I think it's really helping employers and enterprise companies find these talent pools because now we're not limited to one specific area, um, not just in terms of like maybe the talent doesn't exist in that area, but also think about like the competitive landscape of hiring that area. You know, when we're looking to hire PMs and engineers in Seattle, which is a big office of ours, we're competing with Microsoft, we're competing with Amazon, we're competing with Facebook. Mm-hmm. And it's really challenging for us. Um, but when we open it up to other tech ecosystems and other, um, you know, workforce uh, locations, we're now no longer competing with with other companies. So I think that it, we're seeing a win-win on both ends, whereas now the, the candidate has opportunities that they didn't have before based on their specific location. We're removing the center of gravity, like the, the necessity of the center of gravity. And then we're also enabling us as employers to have access to a much more diverse and wide range of um, talent pool. And I think that's really important. We might have to have Capital Factory change their tagline since their tagline is the center of gravity for entrepreneurship. And I saw, so, Henry, I saw that there's some questions coming in too. So I don't know how you want to weave those into the um, discussion. Yeah, I did see those as well. Um, I think one thing that, uh, um, that stood out to me was uh, I think. Uh, Reading one of them right now. Well, I know, and the, and the company's starting to break leases. I mean, interestingly, right before this happened, Cisco was going through a major, let's look at all of our real estate glee and, you know, what are the badge in rates and why are we spending X dollars in, you know, the second office in Tokyo or whatever that is. So we had started down that path, um, but now, you know, it just becomes a, a more, um, a quicker timeline on those offices that we were going to start to um, close down. So, I mean, that just, that was sort of a, a natural and biosmosis that that happens for us. But I would, I mean, what was it? Um, REI, who was building the huge, huge new campus that is now not going to be um, completed. And if I recall correctly, they took, I don't know, it was 
11 million or 15 million dollars, some huge hit to even get out of that. Um, so I know that some really larger um, larger organizations have already said, no, we're definitely not going to build a huge new campus, right? Yeah, and I think um, there's a question around sort of hiring practices and and you know and and how do we qualify individuals, right? And even the interviews have changed to all virtual, you know. And I remember going into four rounds of interview in person, that full day thing where you're meeting a lot of people in the office, you know, that whole thing has changed. And, and in addition, the onboarding has changed. So you know, I, have you guys seen new processes or new new things that have been implemented for? You know, not only recruiting folks are uh, in areas outside of cities, but but also you know the, the entire process of interviews, the entire process of onboarding. How have that changed to um, you know being more inclusive in a way to to give people a better experience? Well, for us specifically, um, maybe about a year and a half ago, we had an incubator pitch um, focused on virtual interviews, so building a virtual interview platform. Uh, and we had it on our backlog for a very long time. And one of the reasons why we didn't launch it at that time was because we felt it would be too much of a behavioral change for employers to be able to adopt this complete virtual interview platform. Um, just it just it was a behavioral change people weren't used to it you know the the old way of doing things was you meet in person you understand you know you get to 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 meet the candidate um they meet you know they go through rounds of interviews in person um and so we had this great idea sitting on our backlog um but we just didn't implement it we didn't launch it um and we didn't develop it because it just wasn't the right time but then COVID happened and it changed everything and now that 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 um that product has become the forefront of, of the work that Indeed is doing. And one of our new goals is to have every interview on the Indeed platform. So we're putting a lot of, of um, engineering and product development behind this virtual interview platform. Um, and, and we have been implementing it. We've been uh, virtual interview uh, tours, uh, hiring tours, hiring events that we've transitioned to this um, this virtual platform and it's been working really well. It's been solving a lot of really major issues and problems for, for companies who are looking to hire, especially those that are looking to hire, um, you know, at bulk and doing surge hiring. It takes a lot of the, the challenges out of the equation and streamlines and, and creates a much more efficient process that quite frankly, we wouldn't have any other option to do today anyway. So, um, you know, necessity breeds innovation and, and this exactly. is just one of those, uh, you know, indicatives of that. And, and changes timelines, certainly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then Chris, uh, how has Dun & Bradstreet kind of, you know, think about the, the recruiting interview process and how do we qualify candidates? And has that changed at all for your team that, that when you think about hiring? Yeah, as I hear about uh, what Lisa was talking about, I was about to ask for pricing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. Yeah, we'll connect after this. <laughs> okay, sale. Yeah, I got you guys. <laughs> I get a BOGO discount. Um, but, um, <laughs> but overall, like hiring is very difficult in this time. So we're kind of leaning in. We have a combination of full-time employees as well as uh, flex employees. We're kind of leaning into the flex employees, right? So the ratio is a little bit higher for the contractors um, because we already have like a agreement with uh, with the company and we just ask for additional people, right? Yeah. Um, not. A, yeah, I mean, so I see the the trend kind of going towards that, uh, but at the same time, you need a good mix of flex as well as permanent. Um, yeah, so the, the the intake of the people or the the people to your company is very difficult for us. Um, and then the onboarding for the people that we do hire, the onboarding is something that typically you get in hallway conversations, right? Um, so what I've seen for uh, for us, a lot of candidates that we pick from are the ones that already have worked at DNB. It's like the the second time around. So they already have those connections, right? So week one, they usually just talk to their old colleagues, right? Um, but for the person that's brand new to DNB, it's difficult. So that part, the onboarding part is the one that's, you know, I don't know how to solve for. Um, what I've seen though, for one of our employees that didn't work at DNB before, um, she was really aggressive with uh, scheduling one-on-ones, right? Uh, but then again, like when you're working virtually, you kind of go back to the experiences that you had in person. So it's difficult. It's very difficult. So if you have a solution for that, Lisa, that'd be awesome. <laughs> we'll cut after this. Add it on to our invoice. <laughs> that, that's awesome. I mean, it is. You um, know, the, 
it, what a lot of uh, managers have done um, in the walls of Cisco is, you know, the, it, it sounds really hard to do, but spending a good portion of the very first day and the, none of us wants to do another WebEx or Zoom, but spending a good portion of the very first day that person comes on board with the uh, direct line manager and then with some of the colleagues, you know, just in like 30 minute, 40 minute increments, you know, it's not the perfect solution. Certainly, Chris, I agree with you. I, th I think there's got to be more, more ways that we can innovate there, but th that's sort of what we've adopted for the moment. Yeah, and it's certainly a challenge for sure, you know, as we look to bring in more people in, in, within YGC and then we think about how do we and how do we just get them on board as quickly as we can in, in the virtual setting. And uh, it sounds like everyone's kind of having those uh, challenges. And hopefully, Lisa, you've, you've got a product for us that we can talk about uh, afterwards. Um, uh, and I'm going to switch gear for a bit. And um, it, since this is startup week, you know, and, and Chris, you mentioned that there's a little bit of shift towards the full time employees, the flex workers. Right. And then there's, you know, the flex workers are being sort of uh, um, uh, highlighted a little bit more. So um, and the other option when companies think about, you know, when they need resources, will be partnering with uh, outside external firms like a startup. Uh, or like, you know, and, and someone that's building something outside of your organization. Has that come up in conversation, uh, just like the flex worker has been highlighted? Yeah, so for me, like, <clears throat> it's been part of the conversation even before COVID. Um, there's, only, there's only so many ideas that you can think of, like, within your four walls, right? So uh, working with startups, working with other, other companies to basically think about product ideas is very important for us. And when I think about it, when you have a, a, a gap in your product portfolio or any type of your or any any of your offerings, it's good to actually think about like who you can work with externally. So when I think about it, build by partner, and then you could graduate that partner to an acquisition. Um, so that's been on my mind for about ten years. Um, prior to this year, it was hard uh, to partner with us primarily because our commercial arrangements, uh, so things like ref share, also annual minimum commits, and things like that as well as data rights, right? If we embed our data into a platform, like how does our data flow? Um, but we're basically going to lower those barriers so that we could actually invite more startups to work with us um, and basically just get that breeding ground of innovation, right? Um, but yeah, when I think about it, there's different types of partnerships. It could address uh, product gaps, go to market gaps, um, even software. some, yeah. I was going to say something very similar. I have um, a background. I did M and A for a number of years as well. So the first thing, and that was with Symantec and now with Cisco. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about you know the startup infrastructure here is, oh my gosh, there's so many companies that are that are rife for acquisition. I don't mean to say like that, but definitely build by their partner. But um, I'll say this is just sort of on a on a personal perspective. Having moved here from the Silicon Valley. I am completely enamored with our startup ecosystem and the vibe here in Austin. It's amazing. Yeah. And to be quite honest, I'm I'm a little competitive. So every time I hear that Austin just got a, a good like thumbs up for more funding or number of startups that are successful, et cetera, it makes me happy because I like to one up Silicon Valley a little bit. Um, but yeah, the ecosystem here is amazing. Well, hello, Capital Factory, Sputnik, uh, Div Inc. I mean, there's there's so many great opportunities here. So I just love the vibe, personally. Yeah. And Lisa, I know that you're you're launching startups internally, right? And it has that sort of ideas um, have the organization as a whole, you know, uh, shift their focus towards you and said, you know, Lisa, can we launch more things out of the incubator now because of uh, what's happening? Yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting. We are an internal product incubator. So we build everything in house. Our stakeholders are all internal. Our, um, you know, mem our executive um, staff and, and our SLT uh, serve as the investment committee. So essentially, we are operating as a mini startup. Uh, mm -hmm. All of our products, all of our pods operate as their own individual startups. So we're essentially bringing this startup, tech, lean startup, like agile infrastructure. 
um, and mentality and methodology to a bigger corporation, which of course has its challenges, but I, I see it as, as a really wonderful opportunity because we have the resources and the support of working in a large corporation, but we also have detached in a sense from the mothership to be enable, um, to enable ourselves to um, move quickly, to place big bets, um, you know, to, you know, uh, to, um, you know, celebrate the failures and, and repurpose those as, as um, you know, success stories and learn from them and conduct lots of experiments that we wouldn't be able to do at a large corporation. But just given the way that we are built and given our infrastructure and the way that um, we try to operate as a startup, it's enabled us to, to really make place big bets and, um, you know, test new product ideas that we wouldn't be able to do under, you know, this large corporation uh, arm. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting infrastructure and the way that we approach failure, the way that we approach, um, you know, collaboration, the way that we approach working with our SLT members is, I think, really unique as it comes to um, corporate incubation and, and corporate acceleration. And um, it's, it's been a wild ride. I, I really enjoy it. And um, I think we're, we're certainly moving in the right direction in terms of how we operate this corporate incubator arm. Yeah, that's insider entrepreneurship at its finest. That That's the best of both worlds, right? When you do have the umbrella up there, but you're still operating inside your incubator in, in that the fast manner. That's great. Yeah. And you know, one of the one of the, the ways that we operate is through open pitches. So we enable any employee anywhere in the world to pitch a new product idea that goes through um, you know an investment, a pitch process similar to like Shark Tank style. Uh, and if that product gets funded or that project gets funded, then that employee anywhere in the world from any function um, can essentially serve as a founder. We call them founders um, in our in our incubator. Um, and so where what we're doing in instead of, you know, we're not just innovating, we're also fostering this culture of intrapreneurship, which I think is really valuable that people have taken, um, you know, throughout their careers that have really helped them, you know, look, learn more about product development, learn more about user research, uh, learn more about product market fit and building MVPs that they wouldn't have necessarily learned in their specific function, um, you know, at the corporation. That's awesome. And, and I think some of the things that, that caught my attention was, you know, as we talk about inclusion and as we talk about, you know, um, entrepreneurship and startups, um, and I'd love to hear from you guys on uh, that as you think about entrepreneurship, you know, uh, the folks that are pitching internally, their employees of ND, they have a lot of advantages. You know, they have a lot of advantages by knowing the system, knowing how the corporates and enterprises work. Uh, a lot of people don't have those advantages, right? Uh, in a way, they're um, it's just really hard. You know, if you're if you're not in these major cities, if you're you know, if someone's watching this from you know about an hour, two hours away from Austin and wanting to start a company, right? And what sort of advice do you guys have? And from your experience of entrepreneurship and and you know and innovating internally, and I know all three of you guys and are you know working on that side, and you know love to hear that any advice that you have for these entrepreneurs to to you know tackle enterprise level problems that you and how you guys are thinking about it. So I, I'm a once upon another life, I, I was a former entrepreneur as well. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I've, I've sat on both sides of the table, um, both very interesting, both very challenging. Um, and you know, the one thing that I think holds true on both the entrepreneurship side, the entrepreneurship side, the corporate side and the startup side is falling in love with the problem not the solution. Yes. Uh, no. And I think too many people fall in love with the solution that they're building without achieving product market fit. And, and they um, become you know, too one-sided about that or too short-sided about that. Um, and so I think the key to building a successful product or service or, or whatever it is that you're looking to launch and grow and scale is truly loving the problem and understanding that there is a problem and allowing the solution to take whatever form it needs to take. Um, but like I said, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Yeah, absolutely. And I also I think it. regardless of where you are, um, as we talked about earlier, our infrastructure here in Austin, well, yes, it's in Austin, but any one of us can get on a Zoom or a WebEx or whatever. There's just, you know, there's Capital Factory, Epic Office Hours, for example, where you can virtually, you know, come up there and talk to a bunch of founders, all the Capital Factory mentors that are, you know, leaders, business leaders, entrepreneurs, founders. Um, you know, there's all of these incubators. Um, there's so many meetup groups that, of course, are now virtual. I would just take full advantage of everything that 
geographically Austin has to offer, but it doesn't have to be geographic. I mean, you can be, uh, during the Women in Tech event, we had three or four um, women that were in um, India who dialed in for the event. So, you know, don't, geography is not your enemy anymore, I guess I'll say, yeah. <laughs> or it doesn't have to be. Cool. Chris, any, any advice as, uh, um, as your team is working on innovation, you know, something that you've learned uh, from innovating internally, you know, versus someone who has no visibility into you know, enterprises, you know, how can they do better uh, as they think about their venture startups and entrepreneurship? Yeah, this is so the reason why I, I answer last because I love hearing everybody's answers. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're both right. So um, when I think about it, like Wendy, your, your point on basically getting outside the building, hearing people's perspectives, like obviously we're in Austin, we have a lot of that here, but then now like everything's virtual, so we're not limited by geo, right? And then Lisa, everything that you said about basically falling in love with the problem and not the solution. Um, I've seen this over and over again. Uh, I think an example would be, uh, I think about five years ago, like we had this innovation project, not my team, but they spent like several years building a Hadoop cluster and like, well, what are you solving it for? Like, why are you doing this? <laughs> so when I think about it, basically product-led growth, right? Basically, uh, you know, having the product sell itself. And then um, when I think about it, um, getting small slices of deliverables so you get validation in the market, right? So that if you do fail, you're not, you're not spending millions of dollars, right? I'm basically using design thinking as well as human-centered design. And then, uh, Henry, what you're saying, um, being in the enterprise and then innovating, there's definitely advantages, right? Assuming that we capture the failures somewhere, right? Otherwise, you're going to be doing the same stuff over and over again. Uh, but basically, I think there's also learned disabilities, too, in enterprises, right? Uh, if you don't break it down to the actual, like, fundamental assumptions, I guess there's this thing called uh, first principles, where you take an idea and you break it down to the axioms, right? If you don't do that at an enterprise, you kind of just follow what people have been doing over and over again, which is definitely a danger that I've seen. Like, people kind of just say, oh, we don't do this because it didn't work before. Why didn't it work, right? So if you don't have the you know, the, the continual whys, right, on on certain assumptions, then you're kind of just stuck doing the same thing over and over again. But that's a lot. I mean, I know everybody, every all everything you guys said kind of just really stuck with me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I see that Gavin yeah, and put a question in about, um, and I don't know if anyone else has Silicon Valley background. Henry, I think you lived in Silicon Valley as well. Um, you know, what, what other elements of Silicon Valley do we need to learn from positive and negative? And, this is going to sound probably completely sappy, but I am absolutely authentic about it. Um, we were in Bay Area for, I don't know, 20, 20 years. Let's just call it that. Let's not say any higher of a number. Um, but when we moved here, I was so, you know, I'm out, I'm in networking with people, getting to know, you know, what's the local vibe here. Every single person I met with at any event that I started chatting with, almost the first question out of their mind was, how can I help you? Or how can we partner? And that is not at all the vibe that at least, you know, and I've worked in a couple different uh, organizations at Silicon Valley, but that, that wasn't the same vibe. So I don't know whether that's just, I mean, Austin are really cool people, but now there's people from all over, you know, that are here in Austin. But there's, there's just something about it. And I find that incredibly refreshing. So maybe it's just a people thing, but. Yeah, I found the same, I think. Uh... Uh, just looking at the teams, and, and I was based in you know Austin for Facebook, and then looking at the team in Silicon Valley versus the Austin team, it's just a very, uh, even internally, it was a really different culture. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. shocking to see that you know that that much more collaborative and much more helpful to Absolutely. one another. And I don't know if that's a, a it's a Southern thing or it's an Austin thing, but uh, uh, I like it a lot. And you know, it's yay Austin. Like, yeah. <laughs> reasons why I'm here and, and, and surrounding so, and surrounding communities <laughs> yeah and then personally I you know I moved from Boston and I I often tell people that I I talk to more strangers uh, at Austin Airport than I have in 10 years in Boston you know <laughs> and just everyone's saying hello everyone's saying nice things and you know it's just very positive positive community and and uh, uh, it's really cool to see that uh, that has been expanding so fast and you know I'm, I'm hoping that, that we can keep that culture of, of helping each other um, and on that note you know Wendy you and I have talked about some of your 
passions outside of Cisco and you're involved in Girls in Tech, you're involved in Div Inc, you know, and, and what's sort of your mission in those things? And I would love to ask Chris and Lisa your missions as well outside of sort of uh, your day-to-day -day work. Yeah, um, yeah, hugely passionate about um, nonprofits. My, my tagline is um, passionate advocate for all things girl and all things women. Um, my mission is really to raise the next generation of empowered female leaders. So the vehicles are the nonprofits and almost every nonprofit that I'm involved with is focused on either specifically on girls, i.e. Girl Scouts of Central Texas or STEM, STEM Scouts or some underserved community. So it's girls in underserved communities because as we've been talking about all this, you know, diversity and, and inclusivity, that's that's the way I think that I can help our local community and our global community, quite frankly. So it, what I need to learn how to say is no, um, because I'm involved in so many nonprofits, I'm uh, a little crazed, but that's okay. It's all good, it's giving back. You can pass some of those over to me, Wendy, because oh, cool. you and I I'm, talk. Here. <laughs> I'm fairly new here and I think we're, we're very much aligned. You know, I, I, it's it's been proven time and time again that diverse workforces create, you know, much better outcomes. Diverse board boards have, you know, much better outcomes. So for me, I think it's really about empowering um, the underserved group of people who don't necessarily have a voice and creating that voice for them, um, but also creating a platform for them um, and giving them the ability to succeed. You know, going back to the original question about you know, Silicon Valley versus Austin and playing playing the devil's advocate or going on the other side of the spectrum here, one of the things that, that I am a little disappointed in when it comes to Austin is just how homogenous it is here. Um, you know, I would like to see you know, more diverse investments happening. I would like to see, uh, you know, more diverse investment funds emerging. Um, and I think, you know, that's something we as leaders can do in, in the city. And I think that the city is ripe for disruption in that respect. And um, that's something I'm certainly passionate about. So Wendy, I'd love to connect with you after this and figure out ways that we can um, connect forces oh, yeah. and do some great things for, for Austin. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I agree that there's definitely some uh, homogenousness. I don't think that's even a word. I think I just made up a word. Um, but at least we have some that are going in the right direction, i.e. True Off Ventures, Div Inc. You know, so there's yeah. there's definitely pockets of people that at least are really focused on that. And, and I think we can leverage them and help them expand as well. Yeah, you made a comment about uh, Austin not being, uh, well, it being homogenous. So I grew up in Houston um, and then it was extremely diverse, still is. Uh, when I moved to Austin, I did notice how homogenous it was. Um, so yeah, I think it would be awesome to actually, you know, really put that in mind um, when we think about like composing teams and ultimately companies. Um, and when I think about my team, it's super diverse. It wasn't even intentional. Um, I think about the gender as well as like the race. Even the backgrounds, like the education, right? I have world-class developers. I have developers that just started. I have designers that want to pick up code. Um, I have uh, just people with diverse backgrounds in terms of uh, skill sets. So I think whenever you have a diverse background, regardless of whether or not it's education level or background, like you have like a lot more ideas, right? Absolutely. You have diverse ideas, and then if you have diverse ideas, you have innovation. So for me, I think that's super important. Um, just going back to the original question, which was what am I passionate about? Everything. Um, I think I, <laughs> I think I have too many too many passions, but I just don't have enough time. Um, I think a lot of people, um, companies, and then I think one of the things that I could help out with personally is, you know, you have a lot of data exhaust for the things that you're creating. Um, I could potentially help understand how to use that data. Um, so that's a passion of mine as well, and as well as partnership strategies. But overall, like. Yeah, I mean, the comment about uh, uh, diversity is extremely near and dear to my heart. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think uh, I think this concludes our session. You know, I just want to say thank you guys so much for sharing your thoughts. And you know, I love that. You know, we we started from sort of the company perspective and and future work, and then you know, we ended up with uh, personal passions and missions and inclusion. So, uh, you know, really, really thankful that you guys can be part of this and then sharing your story, sharing your uh, mission. Uh, and it uh, sounds like we have a lot of other discussions we need to talk about offline. Um, oh, yeah. And Lisa, your, your product, I think everyone wants that right now for, for the interviews. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Uh, but I'll pass the mic back to Gavin. And uh, thank you guys. Thank, thank you each of you for the, the time today. That, that was awesome. Lisa, Wendy,
Henry, Chris, thanks for your time. And I, I mean, this is the magic we get to see in Austin and hugely supportive to see folks like you, you know, embracing innovation, embracing inclusion, pulling these things out because a lot of, you know, no one wants to be an entrepreneur for their entire life. The whole idea with startups is to grow them. And you're, you're representing companies that are innovative. You're representing innovative roles inside of larger organizations. We want to grow up to be y'all. So thanks for providing the way and being, being mentors and being part of our YGC work. Um, uh, Austin Startup Week something that, that I've loved every year. Um, so it's cool to see everybody adapting to this format. There's hundreds of people watching right now. So thank you all for, for joining us and, and being involved. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Catch you guys. All right, everybody. Well, that was incredible. I, was, I feel really privileged that we had uh, those folks join us today from Dun & Bradstreet, Cisco, and Indeed, um, as well as Henry from YGC. Um, so we're now going to transition into um, a networking session. And if you guys haven't done this before, highly recommend it. It's, it's part of your hop-in tab. So we'll leave this for about 15 minutes. We'll come back uh, 15 minutes from now and, and resume the next session. But take these 15 minutes not only to stretch, but to meet some other people that are here today. Consider this hallway meetings, elevator meetings. Um, so the hop in button will act sort of like chat roulette, if you remember that, um, to connect y'all and you'll be able to trade emails afterwards as well. So thanks so much for joining us and, and I'll see you over there in the networking.